All right, Ling441, we're back, and this time we're going to translate what we have learned about vocal fold physiology and the structures of the larynx into different voice qualities that can be used in speech. Uh, so with no further ado, um, let's just, well, actually a little bit of ado, uh, let's uh, talk or review the vocal fold forces that we learned about last time, um, just to kind of get our bearings. So we talked about adductive tension, which is kind of this force towards the midline, pushing your vocal folds together. Uh, and I described that as um, a uh, combination of the force between the vocal folds themselves and also between the our retinoid cartilages back here in the cartilaginous glottis. And you can contrast that sort of midline force with um, force along the length of the vocal folds, which is called longitudinal tension. Uh, that stretches the vocal folds and will raise or lower F0, generally speaking. Um, the adductive tension will um, determine whether or not you get voicing or voicelessness when you produce speech. Uh, and then you can also think of medial compression, which is how much compression is just in the vocal folds themselves, independent of what's going on with the cartilaginous glottis back here. But that's also pushing the vocal folds together, largely speaking, and also making the tense, uh, the vocal folds themselves a bit tenser uh, than they would be otherwise. Okay, so uh, normally when I um, present this in class, I keep score for how um, different voice qualities change these different forces uh, as we go along. You can do that at home if you want to, but since this is on video, you can maybe just keep um, copious notes about what's going on. Uh, but to start off with, I'll talk about modal voice quality, which is kind of the default or average voice quality. Um, and kind of not surprisingly, modal voice quality is basically kind of um, in the middle of the range of all of these various forces. Uh, so we'll start off with that, but basically I'll talk about um, how each of these three forces, adductive tension, longitudinal tension, and medial compression vary between one voice quality and another and then also uh, we'll look at like airflow um, to try to help determine um, how that might affect things like F0 and the voice quality as well. Okay so uh, this is an example of sorry this is an example of modal voice quality normally I'm speaking in modal voice quality and normally you probably do, do too uh, that's a little bit loud you might not speak that loudly um, <clears throat> that's also relatively low for me maybe a pretty much in the middle, uh, the low end of my F0 range. Uh, if I produce speech with that voice quality, then I have a moderate adductive tension force, a moderate medial compression. Uh, my vocal folds will be relatively short and thick if I'm at the low end of my range. Uh, and if I am, that's because longitudinal tension is low, but that can vary um, from low to high, right? And I can still stay within modal voice quality. Also, I will have moderate airflow uh, if I'm speaking in modal voice. So modal, um, you might remember when we talk about distributions and statistics, if you learned about these things, if you didn't, don't worry about it. Uh, but we talk about things like average, uh, which is a colloquial term for the mean of a distribution, and also the median, which is sort of like the middle value of all the range of values in a uh, distribution. And uh, then you can also talk about the mode, uh, which is sort of the value you get the most often. And sometimes the mode matches up with the mean and the median, sometimes it doesn't. But you can kind of think the modal of modal voice is sort of like in the middle of all the voice qualities, um, which is why it's kind of the most common uh, and the easiest one to produce or the most natural one to produce, if you want to think of it that way. Um, like I said, uh, these are kind of default settings. You can think of it as like unmarked voice quality if you want. Um, F0, you can change by increasing the longitudinal tension that will increase the F0, uh, and you do that through the activity of the cricothyroid muscle. Uh, and you can also increase airflow to get higher F0. Uh, we talked about that a couple of lectures ago as well. And likewise, if you decrease these things, that will be a way to um, decrease the F0 too. And you have to do both, obviously, right, when you're speaking, and you do both all the time. Uh, we learned about that when we were transcribing all those um, Toby transcription utterances back in the day. Okay, so uh, that's modal voice. That's kind of where we start off from. I'll give you an example of a different kind of voicing. Um, this is, uh, well, I'll, let you, I'll play it first and I'll describe what it is. Well, that was kind of fun. Here's another example. All right, so this is, um, actually a former student from this class from way back when, from the first time I taught it 
uh, at the University of Calgary 12 years ago. Uh, his name was Ian Sampson. Hopefully he doesn't mind me publicizing that uh, on the internet, but I don't mind mentioning it because it was uh, pretty cool. He contributed a lot to this particular module for the course because what he had done uh, was he had um, gotten interested in this form of singing, uh, which is uh, a cultural, cultural tradition in the Tuva region um, in the Siberian Far East portion of Russia next to Mongolia, and I believe they do it in Mongolia too. Um, so it's commonly known as throat singing, which may or may not be an accurate way of describing it. Uh, I believe in the Tuvan language itself, it's called Kolme. Uh, I'll give you some more examples too. Uh, basically the way he taught himself is he found a lot of materials about this form of singing online and then just watched them and practiced to death until he became expert at it. Um, and there was, um, there's actually, he put on a performance once, it was kind of cool. Uh, one of the first summers I was here where he uh, kind of alternated an uh, open mic with uh, a guy who did beatboxing and a guy who stuttered but wrote poetry that kind of like took advantage of his stutter in interesting ways. Uh, and then he would do throat singing and they would kind of go back and forth. That was cool. Um, so I, the other cool thing he did is he recorded a lot of samples of this or asked him if he'd be okay with that. And uh, he, he recorded a lot of samples of his different singing qualities for this particular lecture. Uh, and the first one is just him kind of getting into the mode of tube and throat singing. So it starts off in a, more of a modal voice quality, but then you can hear him change it in the middle. And then this one is where he's in the mode. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, what is he doing? So the basic voice quality in Cole May singing is called corrector uh, or something like that. Um, not a native speaker of the language, I'm afraid, but uh, I got, in addition to just the sound files of him producing this sort of sung singing or sung speech, whatever you want to call it, um, I got some EGG waveforms because we were able to use that in the lab. It's a little quiet. Yeah, um, so I don't have my previous notes loaded up, but you might notice some differences from what we saw before. But so uh, when I showed you my basic modal voicing EGG, it was kind of pointed at the tops and the bottoms, right? So we, wa we talked about that at some length, about how that idealized waveform was showing you sort of flat tops and bottoms of the EGG waveform. Uh, but in reality, it's normally kind of peaked uh, and more triangular looking uh, when you actually get a look at it in an EGG readout. Uh, this particular voice quality though is obviously different from that. Uh, it is more flat at the tops and the bottoms. So this top again is where he's getting maximum contact and the bottom is where he's getting minimal contact uh, between his vocal folds. And it kind of stays flat uh, at both the bottom and top for an extended period of time. Um, and uh, basically, the, yeah, so the other kind of difference you might notice uh, that I should have pointed out before uh, is the difference in closing and opening slope. So this is the closing slope, which is very steep, almost vertical, straight up and down. And this is the opening slope, which takes a little bit longer, but it's also fairly steep. And you get a little bit of that angle we were talking about before in this one. Um, basically what's happening is he's pushing his vocal folds together tightly uh, to make this happen. Um, so if he's able to do that, they're able to kind of stay closed for longer and then they pop open. You need a lot of sort of airflow force to pop them open. So they wind up staying open um, for a little bit longer or have, find a more of a steady state at the open phase. And then they snap closed again really quickly in this phase because there is a lot of force moving them towards the middle. And you can kind of hear that maybe in this one where it kind of sounds like he's tightening up his throat as it were and maybe that's where the um, expression throat singing comes from i don't know for sure but we can pretend uh we can listen again a little bit like he's choking himself but not really in either way he's doing it for the sake of art right and science so you can't beat that um and I'll reiterate again here that this voice quality is going to require greater medial compression of the vocal folds than we get in modal voice and also greater airflow to kind of be able to pop them open when they're pushed together more tightly. Um, so I'll give you another example. Hopefully YouTube won't get on my case about this because this 
uh, is part, some of the materials that he shared with me in um, helping me develop this module and it is also part of the materials that he used to teach himself how to sing in this fashion. So these are were found online. I haven't checked to make sure if they're still on there. Um, there was a guy in Wisconsin who did something similar. His name is Steve Sklar and he developed these training materials to help um, educate people on how to sing in this fashion if they really wanted to. Uh, yeah, so these are homemade videos, kind of like the one I'm making right now, uh, but maybe they're a little bit more entertaining. Uh, and I'll show you how this guy explains the process of um, producing this sort of voice quality for tube and throat singing. I'm not going to say anything in it because this might get cut out if this winds up being a copyright violation. I'm trying to use it just for educational purposes, but we'll see what YouTube thinks. Anyways, here we go. I use two different techniques to teach people how to sing with the Horacteur voice. The first one, and my preferred technique because it's very gentle and it teaches you a lot about your vocal folds, is called the bubble. With the bubble, you learn to take your vocal folds, place them next to each other with just a little bit of tension on them and then with a minimal amount of air driven from the diaphragm you make this sound when you do this bubble technique you can feel both with your interior senses and with your mind's eye and if you touch your larynx very gently with your fingers you can feel just at what level in your throat and inside your larynx your vocal folds are at. It's very important that you get in touch with them, feel where they're at, and gain control over them. When you have the bubble down and you can make this sound, uh, then you blend in a little bit of your normal phonation or your normal voice like this again your normal voice mixes with the bubble producing the choric tear voice it's a very gentle way to do it you should get this to where the bubble isn't discernible so you don't hear this discreet popping sound so that it merges smoothly with the voice. You add a little bit of tension, and there you are. All right, cool. So you uh, got to love the hat, and you got to love the fact that he's wearing dark glasses indoors. Uh, but either way, more to the point, um, hopefully that showed you. Well, there's two things in there that um, kind of want to focus on. So he starts off talking about that sort of uh, with respect to like what we normally call creaky voice. He calls it the bubble voice, basically, uh, like that. And then he cranks up the F0 on that um, to create what I am going to refer to as the tense voice quality. Um, so tense voice is sort of like creaky voice, um, which I'll define more later. Uh, but with higher F0, more in the modal voice um, F0 range. Uh, so tense voice, interestingly enough, uh, and he's, yeah, so in the way he's creating the tense voice is by pushing the vocal folds uh, together more tightly, right? Um, tense voice, interestingly enough, uh, can be used to distinguish sounds uh, between, mo between modal voice and tense voice sounds. And I've got an example here from the language MP, which is spoken in Northern Thailand. Um, I've actually, I'll just note, by the way, anecdotally, that uh, I've heard a number of uh, speakers of different languages from Southeast Asia that uh, use tense voice kind of almost by default uh, when they speak. Uh, some Cantonese speakers I've known, some uh, Vietnamese speakers I've known as well, uh, so on and so forth. So this might be an aerial feature um, of language. Uh, I don't know if anybody's documented that other than my little anecdotes there. So anyways, uh, this is also in the same region of the world uh, and we can listen to this. This is also a tone language. Uh, so I might, yeah, I think I'll play you the tones going through. So this is the syllable C produced with six different tones and then two different voice qualities. So there's 12 different ways to say C 
in this language and they all mean different things. And normally in class, it's fun to sing along as this guy walks you through all the different examples. So at home, I'm sure nobody's around and listening to this so other than you, so you can feel free to uh, repeat after this guy. C, 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 C. Darn it. C, C. All right, those are the six tones. Let's listen to them in both regular or modal voice and then tense voice. And I think you will be able to hear the difference. C, 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 C. Right, so apparently two different name these are two different names so one maybe one of your friends is c and the other is c okay uh there's also this one i wanted to point out um which is um the word seven in this language and you might hear at the end of it he does go into creaky voice and that maybe gives you a sense of how tense voice differs from creek c c they're pretty close but the start he doesn't get what uh, steve clark called the uh, sort of discrete popping effect of creaky voice um yeah, and we can, so like I said, with tense voice, you're kind of pushing the vocal folds together more tightly, still maintaining kind of your average range of F0 by increasing the airflow. Uh, you can push the um, those parameters uh, even higher to an extreme where you get what is called ventricular voice, uh, where these false vocal folds or the ventricular vocal folds uh, start to come into play. Um, yeah, so this has a very distinct quality and you can once you know what it is you you will definitely recognize it if you hear it again uh, so I've got some samples here of the throat, throat singing version of this voice quality yeah that was Ian switching back and forth between sort of the tense voice quality and the ventricular voice quality. Uh, and so basically what is happening here again is you're pushing the vocal folds together so tightly um, that not only the vocal folds themselves come into contact with each other, but these ventricular folds are actually able to come into contact with each other as well and um, create their own phonation, phonation cycle due to you know the Bernoulli effect. Um, so they generally do it almost at the same time as the true vocal folds do. They might be a little bit out of phase with the true vocal folds, um, but usually at the, basically the same rate. So that gives you kind of like a double pulsing effect uh, when you listen to it. And that's pretty easy to spot um, when you get the hang of it. This is called Kargira voice in uh, the tube and throat singing tradition. I'll play this sample again so you can hear it again and hear that sort of switch between the two and then I'll play the other two samples as well. Um, there's somebody you probably know who uses this voice quality. I'll let you think about that as you listen. Yeah, we'll do the second example. Pretty cool, right? Just a Calgary kid sitting in his basement. Uh, you never know what goes on behind closed doors sometimes. But like I said, there is somebody famous who uses this, or I guess a somebody who used to be famous because, uh, or he's still famous, but not still around. Anyways, uh, let's see if you can identify this voice. I've been on Jimmy for a long time and following up his music too. And I had to meet one morning and, and Jimmy said, man, I feel like singing some blues, you know? Mm -hmm. I said, okay, daddy, you sing some blues and I'm gonna blow behind you. And that's the way the record started, you know? <laughs> yeah, so that's Louis Armstrong, a uh, famous musician, jazz musician from the uh, primarily early 20, 20th century, um, but also part of the second half as well. Uh, what a wonderful world and all that. Um, so uh, he uh, uses, this is a, a token of him speaking. Uh, but he uh, so it's more frequent for him to use ventricular voice in speech rather than in singing. Uh, but it's kind of 
distinct uh, distinct part of his uh, overall voice quality. Uh, I can give you another um, example of a video where Steve Sklar uses this uh, voice quality because it's part of tube and throat singing in general. Uh, so we can watch this for the next minute and he can explain to you how he gets it to work. What we need to do is gently constrict the inside of the larynx just a bit above the vocal folds. This will bring the ventricular folds closer together where the airstream will grab them, causing them to vibrate. It is important that you are able to recognize this sound, which I will demonstrate in a moment. Things will get a lot more interesting when the vocal folds are voiced, too. Here is the sound of the ventricular folds alone. Now I'll begin with the sound of the ventricular folds and then add in the vocal folds. Yeah, isn't that fun? Um, so cool. So that basically just goes to show you there's two different kind of vocal folds vibrating potentially in conjunction with each other, potentially, potentially independently of each other. Uh, I'm not going to try to demonstrate getting the ventricular folds to vibrate by themselves here. I often run into trouble with that, but if you practice at home, I think you can get it. Um, I'm also gonna mention, I'm gonna play one more uh, Steve Sklar video, um, an endoscopy video for him, but uh, I'll also mention that if you, like me, like to watch curling during your long Canadian winters, uh, it's interesting that a lot of curlers, when they're like screaming at each other while shots go down the ice, uh, will often wind up screaming in ventricular voice for whatever reason, um, perhaps because there's a lot of tension uh, coursing through their bodies as they're trying to win the all-important curling match, uh, which I always enjoy watching. Drives my, what's, my wife nuts. But anyways, uh, here we go. Um, this is a nasal endoscopy video with Steve Sklar, so you can see exactly what's happening with his ventricular folds as he produces this voice quality. That's a nice picture. Doing okay? Do you want me to go further down? Is this good? Yeah, they're moving. Good. On and off. Sustain longer. Yes. Perfect. Keep going. Poofer. Thank you. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I think you can see from that video how the two sets of vocal folds can operate independently of each other. Um, and yeah, the, again, you can't see the individual touches of the different sets of vocal folds, but um, you kind of get a sense that they're vibrating very slowly. Uh, that's another thing I wanted to add uh, is that the um, F0 of this sort of voice quality tends to be really low. And you kind of get a sense of that because he's actually shortened up his vocal folds so much. They're slack in the longitudinal dimension, but then he's pushing them tightly together in the sort of crosswise uh, or medial compression dimension, right? So lots of tension this way, very little tension this way is kind of what helps you get that um, interestingly combined voice quality, I guess you could say. Uh, okay, so I've got uh, also an EGG waveform from Ian from back in the day. Uh, this one wound up being a bit noisy. Uh, you can kind of see the noise here. So I'm not sure if we we're getting like the greatest signal uh, through his larynx as we were trying to collect the data uh, or data. Uh, maybe I've got, um, yeah, it's hard to hear this. This is what he was doing when I was collecting this. Kind of fun. 
Um, and you can see again, uh, one of the more distinct qualities of this is that we get a very steep closing slope here and the opening slope uh, is not as steep as it was before for a tense voice. So it takes longer to get these things open because you're trying to push them together so hard, but they come back together very nicely. Uh, and maybe the tops and the bottoms aren't, or at least the top isn't sort of squared off quite as much as it was for that tense voice EGG. But they're kind of the same in spirit, right? Because you're pushing the vocal folds together pretty tightly. Um, yeah, so I mentioned that um, amplitude is larger as well. That's something you won't necessarily notice just off the bat because you can't see the other one on the same slide. But um, this uh, voltage number here at the top is actually larger than what we saw before. So that one was 1.196. This is 0.1449. So if you push the vocal folds together tightly and get more contact between both the true and the false vocal folds, then you're going to get more contact overall for your EGG. Um, so that should crank up the overall conductivity of this sort of signal. Um, yeah, so that's what's going on with ventricular voice. And like I said, both of these voice qualities are kind of related to what we normally call a creaky voice. Um, in speech and hearing circles, they often refer to this uh, voice quality as vocal fry or glottal fry. Um, yeah, so this is fairly similar in that you're trying to push the vocal folds together relatively tightly, uh, but the F0 is going to be a lot lower normally. So I'll give you some examples of different speakers using this. Uh, that one's me. Uh, like I usually say, if you've ever listened to me speak, you've probably heard me speak in creaky voice because um, I use it quite a bit. Uh, people have gotten excited about this voice quality in recent years because it's been um, discovered or people have finally noticed or maybe it's a new novel phenomenon that young women tend to use it a lot, like this particular speaker. And, I mean, they broke up and got back together like five, six times, something like that. Or the speaker. This is actually like an apartment building. It's weird. We're like on the third floor. Uh, yeah, so it's a bit odd. Uh, that this happens because uh, a lot of people think of it as um, uh, masculine voice quality, or if you actually ask people what they think about it, that's what they will tend to defer to it as um, in terms of whether it's masculine or feminine. Uh, but women use it anyway, so there's kind of an interesting disconnect there. Um, there's also cases, of, of course, of men using it. A classic example that people used to cite more often when this guy was more famous was President Bill Clinton. Because uh, he would use it. Um, this is the a clip from uh, the former basketball coach at the University of Illinois during the one year I worked there. Uh, both Bill Clinton and this guy Bruce Weber um, speak in relatively high pitched, creaky voice, but you still get that sort of discrete popping effect of the voice quality when you listen to them. There was a kid uh, on, in, you know, in a program that got arrested a couple weeks ago and he played on another team. Yeah, so. That's creaky voice. Uh, how do you make it happen? So uh, generally speaking, the ventricular, you're pushing again towards the middle and also the ventricular folds are gonna be compressed down on the true vocal folds. So you're losing that sort of uh, space in the, ventri uh, the ventricle in between the two types of vocal folds there. You get high medial compression, so lots of uh, force towards the middle and then very little longitudinal tension. Uh, so you slacken things up lengthwise so the vocal folds get very short. Um, and then uh, you get low airflow. So uh, because there's not much tension lengthwise, it doesn't take a whole lot of airflow to pop them open, or at least you have to sort of um, coordinate the two such that with low airflow and little longitudinal tension, you wind up getting very low F0. So F0 is gonna be so low that you can often hear the individual openings and closings of the vocal folds. Um, Apparently what happens is the air bubbles up kind of sporadically through the vocal folds near the thyroid arch, so towards the front um, of the body. Uh, and again, you can hear it. Uh, 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 sometimes it's fun to just like take your vo voice all the way down and see how slow you can actually produce this um, voice quality. Uh, uh, what's the lowest F0 I can get? Um, I will show you an example. Well, yeah, actually maybe I'll give you this EGG first, then we can look at the video. Um, yeah, so EGG, this is kind of the idealized EGG waveform that I got out of a, um, out of the guide to the EGG actually. Uh, so it was supposed to, well, there's a couple things going on here. You notice there's, um, more variety in the amplitude of in each individual glottal pulse cycle. 
Uh, this is me, an EGG of me actually producing Creaky Voice. That's me, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and this is just the five part of it. Yeah, and which is what I'm showing here. And you can see that sort of variation in amplitude for these uh, peaks of the glottal cycles. Uh, they're not consistent. So it's Creaky Voice is interesting because it's not consistent in either amplitude or time. So there's lots of variability in when the um, glottal cycles appear. Right. With modal voice, it's pretty consistent. I mean, you can change it up and down smoothly, uh, but normally you can just, ah, uh, and I'm getting cycles consistently um, every single whatever seconds. Uh, if I do, uh, it will wind up being having more variation in time and in amplitude uh, than modal voice. So I'll show you the creaky video and then we'll talk a little bit about that variation. Do, 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 do. Bear with me here for a second. Yeah, so this is the one you might have seen in class in 341. We'll watch it again a couple times. Normal phonation first. E and then vocal creak. E Yeah, so it's a bit hard to see there, but one thing I think you can tell is that when he speaks in creaky voice, the vocal folds get a lot shorter, right? Because it's a lower F0, a lot less longitudinal tension. Normal phonation first. E and then vocal creak. E Uh, so that's how you make creaky voice. How do you spot creaky voice? It's also pretty easy to do that. So it often emerges at the low end of a speaker's uh, F0 range. Uh, so in a language like English, look, so since I've studied this voice quality uh, a bit, um, basically where you're gonna get it uh, primarily is at the ends of utterances, usually after the last pitch accent, the last the nuclear accent um, in an intonational phrase and you get that kind of low, low contour at the very end, that will give you creaky voice for a lot of different speakers because uh, they're kind of just descending to the bottom of their F0 range and going past where modal voice is willing to go. Um, so that's a common place to find it. Uh, also, you will often get it at the beginning of words that begin with a vowel or in between words where one ends in a vowel and the other begins in a vowel. Um, it kind of winds up being what they call hiatus. So you can kind of split apart the two words uh, through that kind of creaky voice cue or glottalization as it's sometimes called. And then the last place that you will possibly find it is at the end of words that end in a T where the T itself just kind of, kind of becomes uh, either a glottalized T or just kind of creaky voice um, and not so much an alve alveolar stop. In tone languages, you can get creaky voice in low tones, which is kind of interesting. So here is, um, Here's the set of Mandarin tones, which I played you in, uh, we were talking about super segmentals a while back. Ma, 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 ma. And I think you can notice in that third tone there that when he dips down to the bottom of his range, he gets into creaky voice a little bit. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like in a spectrogram. Ma, 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 ma. Right, and this is just that particular uh, word. Ma. And you can see the creaky voice here. Like I said, in a spectrogram, it's usually pretty easy to spot because it is a lot lower frequency than modal voice, like over here, and it is irregular. And you also often get this kind of double pulse effect, which I believe is the ventricular folds and the vocal, true vocal folds kind of opening and closing out of phase with each other. Um, so that's kind of a uh, trademark tell for uh, when you're getting creaky voice uh, when you spot that in a spectrogram. Uh, right there, uh, the red arrow points it out for you in case you didn't see it before. Um, so this is what is you might see kind of at the end of an utterance. This is not a natural utterance by any means because it's just me saying, ah. Uh. Uh, but this is kind of what it looks like when you go down into the lowest end of your F0 range at the end of an utterance. It goes from something nice and modal here to something kind of really scattered and irregular, uh, which is creak. Uh, and we talked about this before, but you can transcribe creaky voice with this little tilde underneath the, um, the segment that's using that voice quality. Okay, I mentioned this before, but creaky voice often exhibits a lot of what are called jitter and shimmer. 
And I'm going to try to say those words correctly throughout this video so I don't have to record it again. I don't get myself into trouble. But jitter is variation in the timing of glottal pulses. So basically, you want to kind of think of like an average timing in between each of these peaks and how much does each individual cycle vary from that average timing. If you have modal voice, uh, it's, which is normally nice and regular, you're kind of getting consistent peaks throughout time. Um, but for creaky voice, you're getting weird variations from one to the next. Uh, so this is defined as a percentage, which is the period deviation divided by the period duration. Um, yeah, uh, I should give you an example of this, but I don't think I have something loaded up on prot. So I'll probably just walk you through these two measures first, load it up offline, and then show it to you when I come back in the second part of this video. Um, shimmer is the counterpart measure for jitter. So shimmer is variation in the amplitude of the glottal pulses, and you get a lot of that for creaky voice as well. So normally with modal voice, you'd expect um, each of these peaks to be relatively at the same level, but here you get dramatic changes from one cycle to the next. So that's another um, you know characteristic of creaky voice. Uh, something which is interesting, which people have learned uh, over time, um, is that when they first started creating synthetic speech, uh, people actually had this notion um, that if they were playing around with synthetic speech, that they could maybe create a form of what they called super speech, um, which was like speech that was better than humans could produce it. Uh, so the idea being that when we actually speak, we have like lip smacks and other randomness, which we don't really intend to produce, but um, kind of just are a necessary part of, you know, implementing it in a biological system, which is our mouth. Uh, and they thought, you know, back in the good old days, like the 50s and 60s, that, well, we can do better than that. We can kind of get to the phonological core and just produce whatever the intentions are, and then people will love it. Uh, but it turns out that people did not love it. Uh, and that actually when people want to listen to speech, they want speech that has some variation, some mistakes, uh, some sort of randomness in it that makes it sound like a human being is producing, producing it. And part of that is that uh, the synthetic speech should have some jitter and shimmer uh, so that it's not perfectly regular every single time. Otherwise, it sounds too much like a robot, robot or falls into that um, dreaded uncanny valley of you know, artificial human creations. Um, yeah, and I have this thing here where I wanna check out the measures and pro and prepare for that before setting up this video. So I'm gonna stop for now uh, and we'll get back to it by looking at measure measures of jitter and shimmer uh, from a sample sound and prop. So I'll see you in a second.